If you have your Bibles, please join me as we stand and read God's Word together. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Amen. Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. I'm kind of limping up here because my leg fell asleep. <laughs> you ever have that happen? I was just listening intently and my leg, wasn't, my leg didn't want to participate with me after. Thank you so much, Brian, for being here. Thanks for receiving the stuff. Uh, I thought it'd be fun this year. You know, this, this last fall, the congregation brought in just a ton of stuff uh, for folks that are trying to survive on the streets. And, um, and it was interesting. I was thinking about it this morning as I'm walking my dogs, and it's 16 degrees out. Uh, I was thinking, Lord, it's interesting your timing of all things, because Pastor Dave and I had talked about uh, bringing Brian in to receive the stuff that you guys had brought in uh, that was donated. Um, and this message had been on my heart for some time. And of course, you guys bringing stuff in started uh, before even October. Uh, and so the fact that it's 16 degrees outside this morning and we're able to hand off the things that you guys have brought in and get it into the hands of a ministry uh, that's able to get it uh, on, on folks' backs, literally, the coats, the sleeping bags, the gloves, uh, and not only for men and women, but also a lot of stuff came in this year for, for kids. And so thank you for thinking about that. And thank you for thinking about the families uh, that are trying to survive today on the streets in 16 degree weather. I just can't even imagine uh, what that would be like. And so I'm really thankful uh, for organizations uh, like Seattle's Union Gospel Mission, Praise Hallelujah, that's right down the street. Uh, but also for your hearts to care for people that are hurting and are vulnerable and are broken. And that's where we're going to spend a little bit of time this morning. We're going to talk about folks that are a little bit on the fringes, those that are broken, those that are hurting, those that have experienced trauma, uh, those that are downtrodden, uh, those that are among us that are susceptible uh, to systems or individuals that might even take advantage of that. And so, if you will, will you pray with me as we open up God's Word this morning? Jesus, thank you so much for your Word. Lord, thank you so much for life that comes through you, through your Word. God, we pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to illuminate truth in our hearts. God, we want to be changed. We want to be transformed because of us being in your presence this morning and, and your Holy Spirit showing up through your Word. Lord, in changing us. Lord, renewing us and restoring us. God, we love you. We praise you. We lay our lives at your feet. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this account is given a couple, two, three times in, in the Gospels. And this morning we're reading out of Mark 11. Thank you, Pastor Caitlin, for sharing uh, verses 15 through 18. And oftentimes this scripture, usually the focus is on Jesus' righteous indignation. And last week, Pastor Dave had mentioned that in his mes message just because he was talking about his anger or indignation and said maybe it wasn't as righteous. Uh, and he kind of walked us through that process, uh, which thank you for your vulnerability and sharing kind of your own personal story as it relates to Scripture. I really, really appreciate that. And, and so you have this this setting where Jesus comes in and he has this, this action where he's turning over the tables and he's flipping over the benches. And, and so sometimes people look at this and say, well, okay, like, how does that deal with anger? And is, is there anger in me? And is that okay? Well, Jesus seems angry here. And, 
you know, and, and so we make the designations. Well, there's an anger that is fueled by either a blocked goal that we have because of selfishness, which is not righteous, right? But there is a category of righteous indignation or anger um, where it's coming from a place of holiness and it's coming from a place of righteousness and it's coming from a place of, of justice and God's heart to protect, to care, and to come near those that are hurting and broken. Um, I'm sorry for the uh, technology this morning not working because that's an amazing story. And I know it's an amazing story because Pastor Caitlin walked with Steph as she was in Hope Place while Caitlin was program administrator there. And Brian and I personally walked with Johnny. And so we walked with them and we saw them come together as a couple and we watched what God did in their lives as they moved from the street and from those areas of brokenness and desperation into a new place of life, into a new place of hope, all on the foundation of Jesus Christ and their own personal decision to follow him and now follow him together. And so it's a beautiful story and you'll just have to, to trust our verbal uh, uh, testimony of what they've been through and, and how God has brought them along. But over the years of working with folks like Johnny and Steph, I, I soon learned that there are three basic categories in which I understood people living on the streets to be in. And you saw some of the numbers, and some of the numbers can be overwhelming, but we just know there are so many folks that are on the streets today trying to survive. Some that are already engaged in shelter systems or recovery programs, but over half of them, like Brian just said, uh, are trying to still survive on the streets that aren't coming into services yet. And so I'm gonna break down these three basic categories of individuals that, that I would encounter, or Brian or others would encounter that are working with folks on the street. The first is the kind of individual that through life circumstances, sometimes external circumstances like losing a job or losing housing, would end up on the streets um, really of no fault of their own. Now everybody has, am I kind of scratchy here? You are. I'm gonna adjust. I'm gonna adjust. A I could, down. a little bit further down? Yeah. Okay, thanks Jason. He keeps me straight. So there are individuals, and, and usually when we come upon these individuals, you can usually tell because there's almost this deer in the headlights look like fear and just scared about how they ended up in a place where they're living on the streets and, and don't have any resource or, and, and not only just monetary resource to change their circumstance, but oftentimes relational resource. A friend of mine used to say, if I was to become homeless today or lose my housing or lose my job, I would not become homeless. Why? Because I have a relational network of people that I can rely on, that I can lean on, that would help me get back on my feet. But individuals that don't have that, that family and that social and relational network and really that net underneath them, if that has disappeared for any reason, then they don't have the resource of relationship to lean back on and they end up in a very, very dire situation. Sometimes themselves with, we see married couples or even families or kids that end up in this situation. And, and when somebody is in that spot, it's like you wanna do anything and everything you can to try to help them and get them out as soon as possible because uh, what we've found is the quicker that you can get somebody out and they can rebound, the better chance that they have long term. But what ends up happening is if somebody gets and experiences homelessness or being on the streets, the longer that they stay there, then they get used to the new normal. And even if it's really, really difficult, can you guys still hear me? Okay. As long as, even though it's super, super difficult, it's amazing in life how we can, I'm just going to assume that was an amen from the computer. Uh, the longer that, that, that we stay in a place, the more comfortable with it we get to the point that we may not even want to rebound because we just become so comfortable with a new lifestyle. And that brings us to the second group. So the first group is 
those that end up becoming homeless, becoming uh, uh, living on the streets because of a, an external set of circumstances. The second group is a group that because usually of past trauma and hurt that they've experienced in their lives, somewhere along the way, they have picked up drugs or alcohol substances to help cope as, a, as what they think is a useful tool and a useful friend to be able to deal with some of their pain and some of their trauma, some of their memories, some of the things that they want to run from or numb. And sometimes it happens somewhat innocently, like they may uh, pick up something and think, oh, well, you know, I can take it or leave it. But pretty soon they cross the threshold of addiction where they no longer can give it up or abstain from it. But in fact, when they cross over that threshold and then they then become addicted, it rules their life. It governs their life and it governs every, th every decision that they make. Then it is only about getting that next hit or getting that next fix. And they will do anything in order to do that. And oftentimes, the, the high only lasts a few hours, right, at, at best just a few hours, but then when they start coming down off of that high, it can oftentimes evoke physiological pain of withdrawal, right? And so, so not only do you wanna continue on that high, but also now you're trying to not feel that extreme pain of coming off that substance or coming down from alcohol. And so you will do anything to stop the pain. And that's really at the heart of addiction you want to stop the pain. Sometimes it's physical pain. Sometimes it's emotional pain or pain from, from past experience. As you could see from Steph's story, she experienced some very acute trauma emotionally. And it spun her life out of control to a point where she was living out of a tent. So the second group of folks, you may say, well, why would there be people, 7,600 people, <coughs> living on the streets of Seattle when there's so much resource, or King County, when there's, there's recovery programs, there's other things, is it because there isn't enough beds available? What oftentimes happens is services are offered. Outreach teams are out there welcoming people to come back into shelter or into recovery programs, but they have gotten stuck in a place where they're not yet ready to give up the drugs or alcohol. Why? Because they've found it to be an effective tool to numb their pain, right? And so the thought of giving up that very effective tool in their minds is they would rather die, right? And so they become what we term service resistant. So they're resistant to an invitation for change. And sometimes it takes extreme circumstances and and there's words thrown around recovery circles or AA meetings like I hit my rock bottom, right? And that's different and looks different based on everybody's story. But what rock bottom is, is it's that moment that, that the life circumstance becomes so untenable and so painful that they are then open to anything that would change, right? So sometimes it's a 16 degree morning that all of a sudden somebody says, you know what, I, I'm just done, I'm done. There's a phrase that's, that's also thrown around, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Right? <coughs> I'm, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. There's a, a second category of people that are just not done sometimes uh, being out there and, and don't wanna give up the substances, don't wanna give up sometimes the freedom of the lifestyle, and that might sound weird to, to you and I, but coming into a recovery program or other things where there's rules, sometimes is difficult for people. And so they'd rather just do their own thing and have complete freedom to do and say what they wanna do. There's a third category though of individuals. There's those that are very vulnerable and very susceptible that just find themselves on the streets and they don't, they don't know how to navigate those systems and. They're very scared. There's the second that's kind of using drugs and alcohol and they're not quite ready to give it up or give up the freedom. But there's a third category of people that actually prey upon those other two categories. And they have, 
become either drug dealers or pimps or other things where they have made a lifestyle in an industry around preying upon the vulnerable, right? So uh, working for years at the men's shelter, uh, there was women that would come to the men's shelter sometimes. I've shared this a little bit in the past, but uh, there would be women that come to the men's shelter. Now, most guys, when they would see the outside of the men's shelter in the clientele just recently being released from prison or you know being addicted for a long time it's very scary for a guy to show up to that environment to be a woman in that environment uh, is is just on a whole other level but most of the time these women while they could come in for services for meals and and clothing and things like that oftentimes they were under the control of a man and and it was so difficult for us to try to reach through and break through to have conversation with those women because they were so controlled. The men would not want them even talking to volunteers that would come in or staff because they were afraid that if the staff member or the volunteer would offer them hope or a way to get out and, and go into a place like Kent Hope or Hope Place or different women's facilities, that they would then lose their money generating industry, right? And so they would do everything they could to isolate and control the women that were around them. It is not a good situation. And to those that are preying upon the weak and vulnerable, I believe God has a message. So most people look in Mark 11 and look at this scripture and they say, uh, boy, you know, Jesus was angry. Well, why was Jesus so angry? What it invoked and what precipitated Jesus to go in and somewhat violently, right? We don't, we don't think about Jesus in any kind of violent context, yet we have this scripture recorded that Jesus goes in and he, he turns over the tables of those that were, were money changers and he turns over the benches of those that were selling doves, right, animals, and then he doesn't allow anybody to come in and out. And, and the religious leaders take a look at this, and what do they want to do? They want to kill him. It says they want to kill him. Why these extremes? What, what sets up this atmosphere that we have this scene recorded in Scripture? I believe that God is demonstrating his heart for the broken, his heart for the vulnerable, his heart for those that are downtrodden. You see, the Jewish people that were trying to remain right before God had a system that they had to go to the temple and provide sacrifice, right? So they had to go and they had to bring their animal. In this, this case, it was a dove, right? So they would bring their, their dove that they have to be able to sacrifice it to atone for their sins. That was the system that was set up. Yet, when they came, there was uh, an order of the priests or those that they appointed to be able to inspect to make sure that the doves, in this case, are acceptable for sacrifice, right? But what they did oftentimes is they would take a look at the person's dove and say, you know what, this one just isn't going to cut it. It's just not pure enough. But you're in luck. Because guess what? Today, we have folks over here in the temple that have pre-approved doves, right, that you can purchase. So this dove that you brought, this sacrifice that you brought out of a purity of heart, we're going to contend, to be right with God and to make sacrifice for your sins, to be close to God, we have set up a system that we are not going to accept this sacrifice, but you can purchase for a small price this dove that we have set over here. Is anybody like the hair on the back of your neck kind of stand, standing up a little bit being like, hey, I get these calls all the time, like, you know, these schemes, right? Trying to extort money from people. But it gets worse. It gets worse. Not only do they say, okay, we're not going to accept your sacrifice, and oh, by the way, we have these over here that you can purchase, but, but wait, you can't purchase it with that money. 
You see, because there's a, a only uh, acceptable currency in the temple is a Tyrian shekel, right? There's, there's a specific uh, uh, money that the, that the temple priest would only accept. So, but you're in luck. You're in luck, right? You can purchase this dove, which will be acceptable for your sacrifice. But first, you have to go to the money changers. And you have to give your money to the money changers, and they will exchange for you the proper currency, right? Can you guys follow the, the, the line here? So they had this whole system set up that they were extorting people that wanted to come and just provide sacrifice so they could be right with God. Now it makes more sense that Jesus sees what's coming, what's happening, and he comes and he turns over the tables of those that are doing this money laundering, this, this, this ex exploitation through money exchange. And he, he turns over the benches of those that are saying that this sacrifice is not okay yet. The one that we have for a small fee is, right? He sees all of this and he calls it out and he speaks truth in the midst of this exploitation. And he says, my house should be a house of prayer. And instead, it's become a den of robbers, right? You guys are robbing the people that are coming to make sacrifice and to get right with me, to get right with God. And so in this scripture, I think underneath it is this strong current that shows us God's heart for those that are vulnerable, those that are brokenhearted, those that are downtrodden, and those that are vulnerable. To be brokenhearted, Scripture tells us, those that are brokenhearted, that he heals and he binds up their wounds, wounds in Psalm 147.3. He also says in Psalm 34.18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. And as I think about the folks that are on the streets that are scared and they're vulnerable and their spirits are crushed and they're, they're, they're brokenhearted about, about what has happened in their lives, I see God's heart to want to draw near to them. I see God's heart to want to, to as I would say, get proximate to them, to get near, to, to get next to when somebody is hurting, when somebody is broken, oftentimes uh, they don't want just lip service. They don't want just another phrase or other words. Oftentimes I found what people want is somebody just to sit with them and reside with them in their brokenness. To be able to say, I'm not going to offer you all the solutions right now or try just to throw something your way verbally that's going to make me feel better like I'm fixing you but I am going to sit with you and reside with you and get next to you in this. And together, let's see what God does. Let's see how God decides to redeem this relationship, to heal up our broken hearts and our brokenness and, and come to a place where he's going to restore. How are we getting close or near to those that are broken, those that are hurting among us. I had this phrase on my heart as I was preparing this message, and, and it was one of silent suffering. It was one of silent suffering. I know that there are folks among us who are battling and who are waging a war, yet sit in silence and haven't let anybody in. And so it was strongly on my heart almost to push pause in the message and just speak to you this morning. Because there are folks among us that are suffering, that are hurting, that feel brokenhearted, that feel crushed. Number one, I want you to hold on to these scriptures that the word promises us that God is near.
to the brokenhearted. That he will save those that are crushed in spirit. And so as you sit this morning, and as you say, I can't tell anybody about this because they'll think this about me or they'll think that about me. I'm going to ask you to lay it down, to let somebody in, to let somebody know and not to suffer in silence. Bring it before the Lord and bring it to somebody else. There are many times that all sorts of thoughts go through our mind. And I know that depression can, can render us completely like just broken before him at times. And I know it's real. And I know that, that these things can, can go through our minds. And oftentimes when we're suffering in depression, and if we're doing it silently, we feel like we're in this huge pit and there's no way out. And we need somebody else to be able to whisper in our ears that there's hope and that there's life beyond the pit and that there's a future for you that maybe you can't even envision for yourself right now. And so if that's you this morning, I'm going to ask, bring it before the Lord. Trust him at his word that he is near to those that are brokenhearted. And let somebody else into your story. Brian and I, about 15 years ago, we're walking with a guy named Steve. And I always remember this story because of how much maybe it impacted my life. But Steve uh, was just at a point like Johnny and Steph where he was just done with life. He was just hurting so bad from things that had been done to him and then consequent decisions that he made. And so it all just becomes this jumbled mess of hurt and pain. And, and it's hard to even know where to start to unwind that ball once it gets all jumbled up, right? It's like that, that big ball of lights that's all tangled. It's like, I don't even know where the end is that I start trying to untangle this thing. And so it's just easier sometimes either to numb or to run or sometimes when you get to the point of desperation to say, I just want the pain to stop, even if that means me doing something drastic and killing myself. And so Steve got to that point where he was ready to jump off this large uh, kind of drop that was right next to the Seattle um, Pike Place Market. And as he's standing there and he's contemplating ending his own life and he's, he's almost there and he's almost ready to do it, this thought goes through his mind and I believe that it was the Holy Spirit. He said, even guys on death row get a final meal. Even guys on death row get a final meal. And so he's thinking, before I do this, maybe I'll just have one last meal, right? And he's, so he's thinking through his mind. He had no money. And so as he's thinking through these options in his mind, he knew that the downtown men's shelter, where Brian and I were at at the time, had a meal three times a day, right? And so he's like, well, I'll just I'll go down on the mission and I'll get a meal. And so he's, he goes and, and uh, he walks down to the mission, which is a pretty far walk. It's almost the entirety of Seattle, downtown corridor at least. And, uh, and he sits down, and right across from him is another friend of ours named Andrew, and he was one of our lead counselors. And uh, maybe it's just through chance, do you think? No. It's not through, not through luck, is it? It's not through chance. That Andrew, one of the lead counselors who loves Jesus, just happened to sit down and eat lunch right across from, from Steve. And they just started to have a conversation over a meal. And uh, in just that whisper of the Holy Spirit through Andrew to Steve was enough that Steve decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in and stay here tonight. And then he entered into the recovery program. And years and years and years later, best that I know, Brian, you probably know, Steve is doing great. He loves the Lord. He fell in love with Jesus. And Jesus used that circumstance where he was at rock bottom of his story in his life and just before he did something eternal and drastic, a decision in a split second, I believe God spoke to him and brought him down a path that wasn't easy, but it saved his life and it saved his soul for eternity. Are there folks among us that are brokenhearted? You better believe it. And, and you might be one. 
God will use your story and he will use the Holy Spirit within you to be a voice of hope, to be a, a voice of reason sometimes, a, a reorienting. Because when folks are really down at rock bottom and when they're in the darkness, sometimes they can't even see beyond it. You can only see and feel the pain that you're currently experiencing. There's another, though, that so God gets near to the brokenhearted, but God also has a heart for the downtrodden. And downtrodden, what that means is a, a person that is oppressed actually by somebody else that's in power. So being brokenhearted can come through experiences just of life as we're hurt by those sometimes that we have entrusted, either parents or coaches or teachers or whoever, right? Life happens, hurt happens, and we carry with us that pain. Those that are downtrodden are actually somewhat subject to oppression from a system that's set in place, and, or, or maybe an individual. So it can be on an individual level that somebody is, is oppressed, put down, kind of like the gal that I had talked about that would walk into the men's shelter. She was oppressed by a power that was greater than her, sometimes physical or emotional, that they put them in a place that, that they feel like they have no other choice but to live the life that they're living. But it can also be even greater as far as a, a company or organization or, or a country or laws that are put into place uh, that oppress or treat people badly uh, from those that are in power. And I was thinking about this, and again, um, you know, the fact that this is Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, that we celebrate uh, his life and his ministry tomorrow nationally, uh, it was interesting to me as I was writing this, because he spent his entire life in ministry, right? He's, he was a pastor first. Martin Luther King was a pastor first. I've been to his, the house he grew up in and the, the church across the street uh, that he, he kind of cut his teeth in preaching. But we know from his life that he had a specific calling and burden to be able to speak out and to be a voice for those that didn't feel like they had a voice, an advocate for those that felt like they didn't have platform to be able to be heard. And so what did he do? He shouted it from the mountaintops. And, and most often he used scripture as the basis and foundation to draw people back into truth of God's heart around those that are broken and those that are vulnerable. Martin Luther King Jr. spent his life in ministry trying to be a voice and magnify and elevate the voice of those that felt like they didn't have voice. And so as we look at ourselves and as we, we look, and I'm not calling for this radical uh, activism thing, right? But what I am saying is we need to know what God's heart is and we need to operate out of that. Because if we're trying to be like Jesus, and we see that this is Jesus' heart, then I want to act accordingly and want to stand up for those that are being oppressed. I want to be able to recognize and have a lens that I try to look through that sees those that may feel minimalized or those that may feel like they don't have a position to be able to, to use their voice. That can take a lot of different forms. And I'm not going to go into a, a lot of detail about that this morning. But what I want to say is I want us to look through the lens of God's heart for those that are downtrodden. The last one is, is those that are vulnerable. And what vulnerable means is that you are susceptible to an individual uh, uh, that, or you're susceptible to physical or emotional harm. You're just in a place in life where, where you are in need of special care, support, or protection. I believe that God wants us to be intentional and looking for those that we can help build up and support. When we come from a place of power or privilege or resource, then I believe it is God's heart that we try to look for ways that we can help those that are less fortunate, those that may be susceptible to others preying upon them. And I believe that we should be a bulwark for those to protect those that are vulnerable and hurting. For those of the, that, that may not know what a bulwark is, if you could just imagine a marina 
the marina down down here. A bulwark could be, oh, thank you, Judy. Judy, uh, that's a great photo for that. Um, it's really a protective wall. So a bulwark at the marina would protect the ships that are, that are uh, in harbor there. What do you call that? In, in port, whatever, uh, that are parked. Park your boat down there. <laughs> So when storms come, that bulwark is intentionally built so that it takes on those waves, so it takes on that wind, so it takes on those threats and protects the boats that are behind it. I believe that's the picture of God's heart and God's heart for his people, that those of us that are standing in a place where, where God says, I want you to be a protector. I want you to make sure that those things that are coming at our people, that there are individuals that stand and lock arms together and say, Lord, in your strength, let us protect those that are vulnerable. Let us protect those that are brokenhearted and are in a place in their lives where they feel susceptible susceptible to the, the enemy's voice and, and just getting in with, with darkness and despair. Those that are physically, this could be emotional, this could be physical. Friends, there are people all around us who are struggling, who are, who are vulnerable, who are susceptible to those preying upon them. Let us be people that stand in the midst of that, in the power of Christ and and are reflective of his light and his hope for people, for their future, for their current situation. The way that we do that is exactly what you just did by showing up and saying, you know what? Like, I am going to give up myself to be able to provide socks, coats, clothing, sleeping bags, hand warmers. You guys showed up in droves with hand warmers, by the way. Boxes of hand, hand warmers just to survive tonight, it's so easy to get just focused and kind of blinders on our own issues and our own problems. And I'm asking this morning that we would open up our hearts to be receptive and to even be proactive in looking and asking, are you okay this morning? Are you doing okay? Take the time to invest in other people's lives, whether they're here in our congregation that are hurting, that are broken, that are maybe in despair, or certainly people that are out there on the streets, in the world, in our communities, our neighbors that are hurting and are broken and are vulnerable and susceptible, downtrodden, brokenhearted. Friends, God has called us to be salt and light to each other, to this world, to hold on to him and to let him live and shine and move and breathe in and through us. Amen. Jesus, thank you so much, Lord, that you provide example for us as to what it means, Lord, to be a bulwark, Lord, to be able to put our foot down and say, this isn't right. It's not okay to pray upon people. It's not okay. Uh, and Lord, know your heart is even for them, Lord, that you have died for all. And so, Lord, help us know what's right in each, each situation. God, I pray for those this morning that have resonated with a silent battle, or it's something that they're going through, something that's just been haunting their mind, um, that they've been fixated on. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just show up in a very powerful way, God, in each one of their hearts. Lord, I pray, Lord, that just as you promised, Lord, that they would know that you are near, that you are right there with them, that you have not left them, that you would not abandon them, that you have a plan for their life. Lord, and that plan is good. God, I pray that you would surround that person this morning. God, with believers that would just lift up their arms when they feel weary, that would speak hope into their ears and into their hearts, Lord, when they're in distress. God, that we would be a safe church, Lord, for people to be completely open and authentic, that we wouldn't have to put on pretense or masks, Lord, when we come in but God, that we can just be completely vulnerable before you and before each other, trusting, Lord, that you and those that love you, Lord, have their best interest in mind. 
Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in God's peace. Stay warm. Stay well. Amen.